This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Perryton. One of the things we've always stressed about our favorite fantasy games like Dungeons and Dragons is how much they have to teach their players. This is especially true when we're trying to sell non-gamers on the hobby, or to sell non-gaming parents on the hobby so they'll, you know, let their kids play fantasy role-playing games. They increase social skills, we say. They increase reasoning and math ability, teamwork, logistics, and they teach us all about classical literature and mythology. That last thing, the thing about classical literature and mythology, is one that we at the Word of the Week consider particularly important. After all, we'd have no podcast if games like Dungeons and Dragons weren't built on the accumulated pop-cultural descendants of thousands of years of myths, legends, stories, plays, old wives' tales, and superstitions from pretty much every culture on Earth. Which is why critters like the Perryton drive us crazy. Now, we admit that the Perryton isn't one of those iconic D&D beasties that everyone knows, like the Beholder or the Mind Flayer. And it's not one of those ubiquitous creatures like the Orc or the Skeleton that end up in every fantasy thing ever. And it's not like one of those fantastic beasts like the Hippogriff or the Harpy that everyone learned about in their 100 level humanities course from Jason and the Argonauts or Harry Potter or, or something. It's not even particularly well known amongst Dungeons and Dragons fans, despite the fact that it has featured somewhere in just about every edition of D&D since it first appeared in the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual. The Periton is a giant beast that is part eagle and part stag. Usually it's depicted as a giant ill-tempered bird of prey with an impressive rack of antlers. Sometimes, as in the most recent incarnation, it also has the head of a stag. It's big enough to be a danger to adventurous heroes and vicious and hungry enough to attack them on sight. But then, what fantasy monster isn't always ready and willing to chow down on some delicious fantasy protagonist the moment one wanders by? So that's all pretty standard. The only bit of weirdness you'll find in the Dungeons & Dragons stat block for the Periton is that it casts the wrong shadow. Its shadow is shaped like a man. Until you kill it. Then its shadow is shaped like a stag bird. Well, the, the corpse of a stag bird. Overall, you can see why the creature doesn't have the same popularity as, say, the dragon, or the chimera, or the beholder. It's just a vicious predator bird with a weird shadow and someone else's antlers. And that's understandable, because the creature's mythological history is also kind of scant. According to an unknown medieval manuscript, the Periton was a mythological creature of antiquity. The classical Periton is based on a winged deer, and it dwelled in the grasslands on the fabled lost continent of Atlantis. There, it gave every appearance of being a nice, peaceful little herbivore. But that was all a lie. A deception, because the creature was actually a ravenous, flesh-eating monster. Now, the mythical Periton did have an odd shadow. It was, as D&D suggests, that of a human which led scholars at the time to suggest that Periton were born from the spirits of dead travelers who had been washed ashore or killed far from home, or perhaps the spirits of violent sea reavers or marauders. And that was further supported by the fact their shadow only appeared incongruously human until the first time a Periton fed on human flesh. Thereafter, the shadow would conform to the shape of the beast, suggesting the last shreds of the humanity of the spirit was lost when it gave in to its hunger for human flesh. Which is actually a pretty cool story. Now, being a native to Atlantis, you'd think the Periton would have gone extinct in around 1600 BCE, which is when a massive volcanic eruption on the island of Thera occurred and is said to have inspired the myth that Atlantis sunk under the ocean forever. But no, because apparently there's an account of an encounter with a Periton by one Publius 
Cornelius Scipio Africanus, also known as Scipio the Great. Now, Scipio is a famous Roman general who served in the Second Punic Wars and who defeated Hannibal of Carthage at the Battle of Zama in 202 BCE. And the story of the Punic Wars is one we've touched on before, but we've not really talked about Scipio's background. His story is amazing, and we don't have time here to do it justice. So just satisfy yourself for the moment with the fact that Scipio was a Roman general who was born in 236 BCE and who died in 183 BCE and who briefly had an encounter with a periton in the Strait of Gibraltar at some point. Which means the periton didn't go extinct when Atlantis sank and lends credence to the idea that they are born of the spirits of lost travelers or pirates and not native creatures of the lost continent. Except none of that is true. And when we say that, we don't mean that there was never a living creature that was half stag and half eagle that was born from the spirits of dead pirates and once tried to kill a famous Roman general so that its shadow would match. Of course, that's not true. But what we are saying isn't true is that this myth, this legend, this antiquated tale from an unknown medieval manuscript isn't a myth. It isn't a legend. It's not from antiquity. There's no evidence of a medieval manuscript. It's not a classical mythical creature of yore. It was invented in 1957. Let's talk about Jorge Luis Borges. He was an Argentinian author, poet, and essayist. Born in 1899 to a well-to-do family of British ancestry in Buenos Aires, Borges was a big fan of English language literature. He learned to speak English before he learned Spanish. Encouraged by his father, he became an avid reader. He loved Mark Twain and H.G. Wells. He was a fan of Miguel Cervantes. He even read classical stuff like The Thousand and One Nights. And in 1914, just before World War I broke out, his family moved to Geneva, Switzerland. There he earned a bachelor's degree, and then he began traveling. During his travels, especially when he ended up in Majorca, Spain, he encountered the burgeoning ultraist movement. See, young writers in the early 1900s were kind of fed up with what they saw as stuffy and overbearing structure and traditional rules and adherence to classical ideas in contemporary literature, and especially in poetry. They preferred free verse to structured and metered poetry. When they did adopt structures for their poetic works, they were complex with elaborate meters and rhyme schemes. They wanted their work to defy standard critical analysis. They used bold, complex metaphors and bizarre symbolism. Think of it as a sort of surrealist movement for poetry. Kind of. And Borges got wrapped in it, and he became very active with a socio-political movement known as Generation 1898. See, in 1898, there was this war called the Spanish-American War. It started with the people of Cuba rejecting Spanish colonial rule and raising a bit of a ruckus, a rebellion. The Spanish government took some pretty brutal measures to end the rebellion, and American sympathy for the plight of the Cubans rose. Now, William McKinley, President of the United States at the time, didn't really want to get involved. He had successfully campaigned on a number of economic reforms and was helping the country's economy stabilize. But the American public really wanted to help the Cubans. And newspaper publishers at the time, sympathetic to the public view, saw an opportunity to influence the President by whipping the public into a frenzy. First, they published a letter written from Spanish minister Enrique Dupe de Lome, which described McKinley as weak and cowardly, which is why Spain didn't fear American intervention in Cuba. And then, an American battleship, the USS Maine, exploded in Havana, Cuba, and 266 Navy sailors and officers were killed. 
Although an investigation showed the Maine's explosion had been caused internally and was likely the result of a gun or munitions malfunction, the American press ran the story that the Maine had been attacked by Spanish loyalists in Cuba. This is probably the most famous incident of fake news in American history. In fact, it resulted in the coining of the phrase yellow journalism. And it worked. The public, already eager to help the Cubans, raised a huge clamor and demanded intervention. Congressional leaders who wanted to placate the public were eager to take action, and President McKinley had no choice. And so, the Spanish-American War. The Americans were so successful that they freed not only Cuba, but also the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Cuba became an independent nation, while Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands became protectorates of the United States, semi-independent states under the protection of the U.S. military. Now, this created a big stir in American politics about imperialism and colonialism, but that's not the point. The point is that Spain was humiliated. See, America wasn't the global power it is today, and the European nations had little respect for it. Meanwhile, Spain, who had once dominated the European political landscape, had been floundering for hundreds of years, and so had Spanish culture. So you had this group of Spanish writers and poets who wanted to put Spanish culture back on the map, as it were. And that Borges was a part of the whole thing. And when he went back to Argentina, he carried those attitudes with him. The ultraist attitude of new, experimental, and bold styles of poetry and verse, and the Generation 98 attitude of glorifying Spanish culture, history, and heritage. Borges remained active in politics while working as a non-fiction writer, essayist, and occasional short story writer in Argentina, and also serving a prestigious post as a librarian. He didn't indulge too much in writing fiction until he suffered from a bout of serious blood poisoning that almost killed him and often rendered him feverish and delirious. And in that time, he produced some of his most renowned fictional works. When Juan Perón came to power in 1946, Borges' political views, supporting the Allies in World War II, for example, worked against him. He lost his job and struggled to make ends meet. But when Perón was deposed in 1955, his position was restored, and he then became director of the National Library in Argentina. But his health continued to deteriorate, and he lost his eyesight, which made it difficult for him to write longer works so he returned to poetry and short-form works. Eventually, his health problems cost him his life in 1986, at the age of 86. Now, what does any of this have to do with the periton? Well, Borges invented it, whole cloth. In 1957, he published the manual De Zoologia Fantastica, the book of imaginary beings and it was mostly a compilation of fantastic beasts and where to find them. In mythological history, that is. You could find all of your favorite critters in there. Banshees and Catobaplus, and golems and harpies, and the naga, and satyrs, and trolls, and unicorns, all of that stuff. And you could also find a couple of things that had absolutely no basis in any mythology at all. Like the Aboaku, a strange creature that torments pilgrims on the stairs of the Indian monument Vijaya Stampa, and the Periton. And there's even citations for those beasts, to books that no one has been able to find or prove ever existed. And there's even some evidence to suggest Borges may have created them as a joke about how people will believe anything came from classical literature if you spin a good enough story. Honestly, we'll never know the truth as to why Borges invented the Periton. And it is entirely possible that he did find some weird medieval book that no one has found since and that no one else remembers with some weird myth about a carnivorous stag bird that tried to eat General Scipio that one time. But it's also possible that, even though he did later move away from the ultraist movement, perhaps Borges included it as one last sneer at classical literature and its stuffy fans. 
Carnivorous stagbirds aren't the only imaginary things to bear the name Periton. So let's talk a bit about radio astronomy. Yes, you heard us right. So, astronomy. The study of the stuff in the sky. Stars, planets, moons, galaxies, and so on. We've been interested in the stuff in the sky for most of human history, for both spiritual and scientific purposes. And honestly, those were kind of the same purpose for a long time. They were an attempt to understand the universe and our place in it. If the stars are divine or heavenly objects, their movements might reveal the divine plan or divine influences on Earth. That's the idea behind astrology, and even alchemy. And that evolved into the idea that if we could understand the scientific movements and origins of stars and planets, we could understand the laws that govern the universe. Hence astronomy. Good so far? Now, for most of human history, the only way to study the sky was to look at it. I mean, sure, things changed a lot when Galileo Galilei decided to point a spyglass, a tube containing two differently shaped lenses that would magnify distant objects, at the stuff in the sky in 1609 with the help of lenses developed by Dutch spectacle maker Hans Lippersche. But looking at magnified images of the sky is still just looking, it's just observing visible light. But then, James Clerk Maxwell made an interesting discovery. Well, we say then, but we mean 250 years later in the 1860s. He realized light was just the visible part of a more complicated thing called electromagnetic radiation. And that was something that was spewed out from energy sources in the form of vibrations in an ever-present electromagnetic field, like waves in the ocean. Visible light was vibrations that came at a certain frequency, or more accurately, a certain wavelength, which is the distance between one high point and the next in a wave. It followed, then, that anything in space that emitted light should also emit other kinds of radiation. In the early 1930s, Bell Telephone Laboratories was working on a way to transmit voice signals as electromagnetic waves across the Atlantic Ocean and they'd built a big antenna. But they had a problem. It was picking up weird static, random noise. The antenna had this hiss of radiation coming into it. And it was an engineer named Carl Guth Jansky who figured it all out. He noticed that although the static was pervasive, it spiked at certain specific times of day and when the antenna was pointed in certain directions. At first, he thought it was coming from the sun, but that didn't quite track. Eventually, he realized it was coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, a vast collection of 400 billion stars drifting together through the void of space that happens to also contain our sun and our solar system. And without really meaning to, Jansky invented radio astronomy. The idea is that you can point a radio antenna at a distant object, and you can see it in the radio spectrum just the same way you can see it in the visible spectrum through a telescope. Except there's some advantages. Most notably, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night, and radio waves can penetrate clouds. Usually. Mostly. Again, it's complicated. The point is, a radio telescope can see an object in the sky at any time, day or night, whatever is happening in the atmosphere above it. And the radio information provides a lot of information about the source. More interestingly, if you have two radio telescopes tracking the same signal, you can use a technique called interferometry to cancel out a lot of interference to pick up very weak signals and to resolve objects that would be invisible to conventional astronomy. Since its inception in the 1930s, and with the help of an explosion of advancements in radio technology as a result of investment in radio detection for military purposes during World War II, radio astronomy has discovered and analyzed a lot of previously unknown phenomena. Take, for example, quasars. You might have heard of them. But did you know that the word quasar is an abbreviation? It is. 
It stands for Quasi-Stellar Radio Source. That describes a source of radio waves that looks kind of like a star, but obviously isn't. The first quasars were discovered in the 1950s when radio telescopes were pointed at nothing and picked up a signal nonetheless. There was something out there, in the void, emitting radio waves, but not visible light. And once scientists started looking for them, they found hundreds. Today we know of about 100,000 of them, and as near as we can tell, they are the hearts, the nuclei, of very young galaxies very, very far away. It is further believed that they are actually massive black holes with a halo of matter spiraling into them, like the one at the heart of our galaxy, which Jansky heard in the 1930s. And in 1998, Astronomers using a 200-foot radio telescope at Parkes Observatory in New South Wales, Australia, detected the first periton, and they continued to detect them until 2015. No, they didn't see carnivorous eagle birds flying in the sky emitting radio signals, presumably radio signals in the shape of a man. What they did see was a sudden burst of radio noise coming from the sky. And because of the characteristics of the signal, the bursts appeared to be coming from very far away. And the astronomers were baffled, because after the first signal in 1998, they kept seeing more of them. And, like quasars, there was nothing visible to see, just a sudden burst of radio signal. Very quick, and very... Well, we don't have time to explain red shifts, so we'll say very skewed, very skewed to make it look like it was coming from a very distant object. Now there were some patterns. They always came from a particular part of the sky. They always happened around midday. They always happened in the middle of winter, especially around July. Remember this is Australia where even the calendar and the seasons are upside down. And they matched nothing else known in the universe. It was a lot like what Jansky experienced at Bell Laboratories. But astronomers were suspicious of the signals for one major reason. No other radio telescope in the world could detect these weird signals. That suggested that the signals weren't really coming from space, that it was coming from nearby, or that there was a problem with the equipment. And for 18 years, radio astronomers and engineers at Park Observatory were trying to figure out what the heck was causing these weird signals. They went all over the equipment, scanned everywhere for rogue radio signals that they might be picking up. They did everything. And then, in 2015, they finally found the source of the mysterious signal. It turned out that like gamers, astronomers couldn't wait for their snacks. See, in the employee cafeteria, there was a microwave. Now, a microwave works by emitting electromagnetic radiation, specifically microwaves. Now, microwaves sound like they should be small, right? They should be short wavelengths. But no, in truth, they have very long wavelengths. Why does that matter? Because radio waves have long wavelengths. Microwaves are actually radio waves from the very end of the radio portion of the spectrum. But microwaves are shielded, so that the radio waves can't get out and cook any errant children or pets or gamers who can't wait for their pizza pockets. But if you open the door to a microwave before the cycle stops, well, obviously there's a fail-safe that turns off the magnetron inside, which is the thing that generates the microwave radiation. It's just that, well, it doesn't do it instantly. It takes a few fractions of a second long enough for some radio waves to get out the door and trigger any nearby radio telescopes that might be listening. So let's say it's the middle of winter and you're hungry and you want to heat up some soup but get impatient and pop open the door just as the nearby radio telescope is pointed vaguely in the direction of the cafeteria. It'll see a weird, skewed blip 
of Radio Noise. We kid you not. For 18 years, the staff of the Parks Observatory Radio Telescope was mistaking radio noise from employees opening the microwave early for mysterious space signals. And thus, the word periton entered the radio astronomy lexicon. It refers to a radio signal that looks like it's a distant, ancient, and totally legitimate signal from space, but turns out to be local radio noise from some unshielded radio-controlled toy, or a microwave, or a small aircraft flying in a weird way, or an experimental military satellite, or whatever. And astronomers hate them. Because astronomers, like gamers, and like American government officials, all hate thinking something is real, or legitimate, or important, or classic, when it's actually just a joke, or a lie, or an accident. We all hate to be fooled. And that's why we hate the Perryton. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>